All right, I think we are live. Welcome everyone to the Deep Tech Funding Panel. Thank you all for coming. We're gonna kick things off here, just a couple minutes. Um, as you come in, if you guys can please in the chat on the right hand side, let me know if you can see and hear me okay. Uh, and we're gonna get things started here really quickly. Um, as you come in, please introduce yourselves in the chat, where you're from, what you're doing, who you are, drop your LinkedIn, your email, whatever. Um, and if you're looking for anyone specific, you can also search them. Oh, there's it. Hey, it worked. Uh, fantastic. Okay, cool. I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna do a quick intro here, but I'm glad, I'm glad this worked and you're able to, I can see and hear you, fantastic. So we're gonna kick off uh, the, the panel in just a few moments. I'm gonna remove him, okay. Fantastic. All right. Thanks, guys, so much. Olga, Pat, Corey, Elizabeth, thank you. Thank you, guys. Shereen, Tommy, Jonathan, thank you guys all for coming in. We have a fantastic event. Um, you know, we're super excited about this. We have a really interesting topic, deep tech, AI, big data, machine learning, robotics, drones, all sorts of fun stuff. So it's going to be really interesting to see how what we get into. Uh, we're super excited for this. If you guys have never been to one of our events before, or if you don't know who we are and what Entra is, we're a social network for entrepreneurs. So we do a bunch of events, usually in person with everything going on. Um, you know, we had to switch to virtual events to just to continue bringing people together, to continue networking and, and providing value for everybody. So hope everyone is safe and healthy. Um, you know, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on right now, but right now is a huge opportunity for everyone to, you know, continue building their businesses, get into different industries, get into different markets, um, pivot um, and adapt to what's happening right now and continue building their businesses. So, uh, again, thank you guys all for joining. It looks like we have people still coming in. So if you're just getting here, please introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, we're going to be dropping links throughout the whole time. Uh, for people as they come through. Uh, so if you're interested in anything that we're doing, anything from the speakers, we'll be dropping the links in the chat uh, for everybody. So at the beginning, um, you know, we usually like to just share a little bit about what we're doing here at Entra, all of our upcoming events and everything. We just released our app uh, to connect entrepreneurs outside of events and really just from around the world. Uh, we have it iOS only right now. We're going to be rolling out Android in the next couple of weeks. It is invite only um, at the moment. So uh, if you're interested in that, we are going to drop. Um, let me just find this real quick and bring it over. If you guys are interested in checking out our app, and if you have an iPhone, you can use this link uh, right here that I just put in the chat to, to get into the app. Uh, so this is gonna be like early access only, private, um, just people in our network right now. And then we're gonna be expanding it as we go. Um, without further ado, I'm gonna bring up Josh Baron from Eagle Point Funding. He's one of our panelists. He's also gonna um, tell you a little bit more about Eagle Point Funding. Uh, and basically an alternative source of funding, uh, non-dilutive funding that you can actually get through government grants. So it's a really hot topic right now with PPP loans and all this stuff, but there's actually another type of grant that you guys can get if you're building out technology companies, especially deep tech, um, which is a research and development grant. So Josh is going to share a little bit more about this. Um, and let me try to bring him up here real quick. Uh, and we'll have him share more about Eagle Point funding. Um, this is going to be a really fantastic event. We have two amazing VCs and then obviously Josh from Eagle Point. We're going to get into a lot of really cool stuff on deep tech funding, how to talk to investors, what investors are looking for in this space specifically. Um, because it is very different than other industries. It is very unique in the fact that you guys are probably building something if you 
are a founder of a deep tech company that is really advanced game changing technology that might take years and years to develop. So um, it's a really cool like event that we have planned. Uh, we're going to get into some interesting topics throughout the event. If you guys have questions on anything or if you have topics that you want us to discuss throughout this event, please drop them in the comment section. You can also, if you go over to the people tab on the right hand side, you can actually uh, search my name and then you can message me directly uh, with your question. So more than happy to, to answer you guys and like, let's get these questions going, you know, for our speakers and everything as the event's going on. Um, let me, uh, let me see if we can get Josh to come up here real quick. Um, and we're going to kick things off here. Give me one second guys. And let's see if we can get Josh up here. Sometimes using these uh, <laughs> these other platforms can be a little bit tricky. All right, I think he's coming right now. All right, Josh should be showing up here. Hey, Josh. Hey guys. Hey, <laughs> thanks, How Michael. How you doing? Uh, fantastic. We're we're super excited to have you and Eagle Point as part of this event. Um, I gave you a quick introduction as to like Eagle Point, but I love for you to go more into it. And then I know you have, I'm going to pull up here uh, a little just like presentation about Eagle Point and how to get this R&D grant and what you guys do and how much it can benefit like the founders and the startups within our network as they're developing their technology. So I'd love for you to share uh, more about this. Yeah. For, and thank you so much, Michael, for, for bringing us and the other panelists in. Um, I, I, think, I think that any sense of community during these times is really important. So thank you. Big thank you for it beyond the actual effort of you know, helping these companies uh, hopefully learn more about um, opportunities for them. But I think just the sense of community, it's so vital. It's so important today. Um, and, uh, and so what we thought we'd do or what I thought I would do is, is better, better um, introduction to our space because I think um, the, the venture space is pretty well known. I mean, we're gonna hear some really, really interesting VCs today, but um, also um, to bring up the topic, give a little bit of background, set the scene for um, what we're talking about. We talk about federal grants and contracts for research and development. So um, I think the presentation uh, of mine, if you put it right on the screen, um, I'll get started. Michael, you still hear me? Are we all good? Yeah, just in the chat box, let me know that everybody can hear me. Hey, Josh. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. You hear me okay? Yeah, um, yeah I'm uh, pulling it up right now. You guys should be able to see my screen. Are we good? Okay, good. And thanks, thanks for everybody chipping in. Everybody hears us okay. So what we're going to be talking about is um, deep tech funding um, from a non-dilutive perspective, which is, um, you know, I titled this Thriving Despite a Pandemic and Slowed Economy with Federal Grants. Um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to go just do Grants 101, um, but also talk about some more um, time-sensitive um, grants, both um, COVID-centric and COVID-centric. So um, just, uh, Michael, can you go to the next slide? Um, so this line is just uh, business is, is normal at the federal agencies to uh, the challenge of telecommunity. Um, and the federal budget is still standing at what it, it was set for in the beginning of the year, $161.5 billion available for research and development, of which um, the red you see in the picture is the private sector share. It's about 30 to $60 billion annually. So it's a, it's a significant chunk of change. Um, it would make the U.S. government uh, by far the world's uh, biggest uh, uh, venture capitalist. That's what we're seeing right now. Um, you can go on to the next slide, Michael. Um, then this happened. COVID-19, the pandemic, the big scare. Everybody um, has a, a real legit reason to be concerned. 
Uh, and, and as a result, we've had a lot of slowing down on, on the private sector side. So what's happened and as a result is the federal government sees itself and its place as, um, as one of the things that it is meant to do is to boost the private sector when um, it's stalling. And so there's this incredible um, stimulus package valued at $2.2 trillion. Um, I don't know what's going to go to research and development. Um, it's yet to be seen, uh, but it's, it's likely that there's going to be boost also in the R&D side. Go on to the next slide. Uh, this is just a slide showing that um, the Air Force is still going on um, despite um, difficulties. The next slide um, shows that there are also COVID-19-centric opportunities. These are really interesting. Uh, our um, firm focuses outside of the life sciences, and there are both life sciences-related um, COVID-19-centric opportunities funding for research and development, as well as non uh, medical and non-life science related. And that's really cool because there, there's just so much that can be done to help out. So um, we see that there is both business as usual, the standard interest that we have, and we'll talk about that means exactly, okay, um, as well as a, uh, an influx of, of cash, which is supposed to stimulate um, both COVID-19, fighting the good fight, as, as the Air Force calls the United Fight, program, which is now a Department of Defense-wide program, um, but they're looking to make investments in companies that they think they can make uh, an impact both on the economy as well as to fight COVID-19. So the next slide just kind of gives a big overview about what the type of different mechanisms that you can see. Um, one, you might have heard of it is a SIBR or our program that prioritizes all businesses um, and gives them an in initial of $150,000 to $250,000. Assuming you reach your milestone, you get follow up funding of $750,000 to um, a million, um, which would also go up to $1.5 to $2 million. Um, there's also commercialization assistance. Um, some programs offer up to $15 million, which may require matching funds from an investor, um, as well as, and I think this is the most important um, component of it is an opportunity to be involved in a business pathway, business, business relationship with the government. Because you develop something, the federal agency like the Department of Defense or Department of Energy saw what you were doing, and now they have a opportunity to try to become a customer of yours. B2G, business to government, um, where you're likely, if you've got a government client, it's going to help you in everything else you do. Um, on top of that is another mechanism called broad agency announcements, uh, which is up, open for big and small businesses, open for foreign companies as well, at least a lot of the programs are, and offer very large range of funding, um, largely dependent on what your budget needs are. So just a quick definition, when we talk about dilutive versus non-dilutive, and this is the next slide already, Michael, um, it, dilutive versus non-dilutive funding, what we're talking about um, program, which is different to what you know in venture capital, sharing, there's no interference or, or ad members or anything, and all IP rights are maintained by the, which is similar to VC as well, um, it, all maintained by the company. The government just wants you, you to develop what you're supposed to develop, and they have two main reasons. This is on the next slide, uh, why the government actually makes these investments. One reason the government makes investments is because they are seeking solutions to challenges that these agencies face themselves. And that means there's a high uh, chance of uh, also leading to a follow-on procurement contract where the government is your customer. The other reason, uh, number two, is seed funding um, for the private industry, which is largely what we're seeing in COVID-19, where there's a mix of both one and two. So just take a look at what that looks like. And this is the next slide. Um, already funding for solution seeking means the government, um, let's say the Department of Defense or Department of Energy, has a challenge and they really need great technology to solve this challenge. So they post an opportunity for R&D funding. They learn about what's out there for potential solutions. They make a spot investment. They see how you do on the R&D and then they have the opportunity to also become a customer and you, the, the company, have the right to sell to them or not to sell them dependent on what you want to do. Um, in the next slide, you see that there are programs that now have built in follow on um, sole source contracts with the federal government. It starts with R&D funding of typically um, anywhere between a couple hundred thousand to a couple million dollars. Um, and then leads directly into um, a business to government relationships. One program is called AFWORKS, fantastic program. Um, the Air Force is saying, pitch to us what you can do for us. And if we think it's good, then we'll start with a micro grant and we'll lead to a longer term relationship, hopefully ending with a sole source contract, which is a multi year, multi million dollar engagement with a federal agency. The second reason they do this is on the next slide is seed money for the private sector. 
Um, and already on skipping to the next slide, you see that this has a mixture of altruistic as well as capitalistic motives. So the altruistic is obvious, good tech, good for society, good for the economy. But the capitalistic motives is that the government sees that if they invest in you, they're able to eventually collect more taxes as you, your company pays taxes, import, export, you know, salaries, et cetera. It's a good move for the government. And they actually see an ROI of about $2.30 for every dollar they invest in. Um, just two quick things. When we talk about this, I don't want you to leave away without, you know, without something tangible. So in the next slide, you'll see that um, uh, we're talking about upcoming opportunities. These are great programs. Um, the, the government used to be known as being very slow to engage with, um, with private sector customers. It's not the case anymore. This is a great program uh, from the Navy um, called it Get Funded in 60 Days. It's a, for an out of cycle small business program. Um, the Department of Defense has a small business program going to be open with over 100 topics typically um, in May. Um, the National Foundation calls themselves the Seed Fund of America. They're open on an ongoing basis right now. Um, the Air Force's open call is about to open very, very soon. And uh, actually, May 6th, I think, is the pre release date. Um, and they're also, they, these, this company or this organization funds within 60 days of uh, submission. Um, there's a global program called Global X. Um, and there's also the Navy program twice in there, so my fault. And the, actually, there's this great program called Agility Prime, which is looking for orbs, which are, you know, basically not drones. And they're not planes, they're, they're flying cars. And this is where the Air Force is getting involved. I think it's an important push for the private sector. And quickly, um, one of the last slides I'm going to touch upon is non-medical COVID-19 um, funding opportunities. There are a very large amount of new programs out there all assist in fighting COVID-19, whether it's from uh, an analytical side or whether it's from um, helping business go on as usual, um, dealing with the uh, incredible amount of um, uh, computer vision and AI technologies that need to be um, um, recruited in order to assist with this fight. Um, and as you see, the major organizations, uh, National Science Foundation, Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Energy, Department of Agriculture, all, everybody is recruiting um, to help with a good fight and they're investing a lot of additional dollars into this program. Um, so you don't leave without understanding what I'm talking about. The next slide just tells you what a grant actually covers. Salaries, subcontractors, instruments, materials, facilities and administration costs, as well as advisors. And of course, a 7% profit, which is built in, means you get a million dollar grant, then $70,000 is there for you to do as you see fit. Um, and just a background of um, Eagle Point funding. Um, we're a division of Freemind Group. Um, which has been, you know, working in non dilated funding for a very long time, where we have four different um, sister companies all focusing on different spaces of non dilated funding. Um, and we had a great amount of success because we approach this in the same way um, I think that you should if you go after it, which is a multi-submission approach, where we, we believe that if there are, um, uh, you know, half a dozen to a dozen opportunities out there, then you shouldn't apply to one of them, you should apply to all of them. So um, we're going to talk about a little bit more on the panel, but I'm um, just um, happy um, it's to, to be there for questions. Um, if you have any, and here's my contact information, josh at eaglepointfunding.com. Um, and Michael, it launches right into the panel. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Josh. That was, that was awesome. Um, guys, definitely please like reach out to Josh. Um, these are, he just went over a bunch of fantastic opportunities for you to get funding without even having to give up equity and all this other stuff. There's a ton of programs out there, government programs, especially right now with everything going on. There's so many resources out there. Uh, Josh and, and you guys do a fantastic job of this. Um, so thank, thank you. you so much for that. That was fantastic and extremely helpful. If you guys have any questions, like he said, um, Josh, if you want to put your email too in the chat, just for people. Uh, sure. So they can reach out to you afterwards as well. Sure. That would be big. Um, and then let's start bringing up uh, our speakers, AJ and uh, Tim here. Uh, let's see if they can. Uh, I'm going to make sure they can come backstage here. Okay. You should be good. All right. Here's AJ. We should be all set. And then let me make sure that Tim is uh, all good as well.
if you guys have any questions, like I said, throughout this whole thing, as we get the speakers on, um, please drop them in the in the questions. We're going to cover a lot of stuff, um, and you know, we're excited about what we have. AJ, how's it going? I'm very well, thanks. How are you? Thanks for thanks for joining us. We're super thrilled to have you here. Um, I don't know if you and Josh had a chance to connect, but um, you know, we're we're thrilled to have you on the panel today. I'd love to start as we as I get Tim in here. Uh, I'd love to start maybe just with your background, uh, if you can tell people a little bit more about yourself and your firm and kind of even how you got involved in VC from the beginning, too. That'd be fantastic to hear. Sure. I, I always love hearing about how, uh, you know, how people get involved in VC because like everyone has a different story and it's a sort of a random industry um, to end up in. Um, I'm AJ Plotkin. I'm a partner at FF Venture Capital. We're a seed stage tech um, venture capital firm based in New York City. Um, we tend to make first investments um, at the very earliest stage of institutional capital at a kind of a mid uh, single digit valuation and then we'll follow on um, until what used to be known as Series B and now we just sort of say around a $50 million valuation or so. Um, our areas of interest, um, which uh, are not collectively exhaustive, and there are many more that are not on this list, but they're ones that we've sort of identified as focus areas are FinTech and InsureTech, um, drones and robotics, and applied AI in industry verticals. So not sort of AI for its own sake, but in the application layer for software platforms that are used um, in actual industry applications. Um, I got my start or I found my way into venture capital, the sort of um, finance route. Um, I started my career at Goldman Sachs out of college, um, where I stayed for two years in the investment bank, and then went back to business school and worked on a PhD for a little while, um, ultimately making my way back to um, the later stage investment world and spent about a decade um, doing various um, hedge fund things um, in New York ranging from distress to um, macro fund uh, based in Princeton. And then around the time of the financial crisis, unwound the last fund that I was involved with um, and was sort of trying to figure out what to do next and ultimately ended up um, connecting with a group of friends um, who were doing a startup insurance company. Um, this is like 10 years ago and startup insurance companies um, well, they're very popular now. We're sort of unheard of then, and most people thought that we were nuts to do it. Um, but we did a new product um, to do supplemental unemployment insurance, which is a subject that's once again very topical. Um, did it for about two years. Um, we sold the company back to the insurance carrier. It was an exit, um, although it wasn't a particularly exciting exit, but it was an exit nevertheless. Um, and as I was kind of... Um, trying to figure out what my next step was. The economy had gotten better and I was kind of hanging around the hoop um, in the New York City tech scene, which was then kind of just starting to become like a real thing. Um, there were always a lot of people doing tech in New York, um, but it wasn't until kind of during like two years after the financial crisis that there was a real critical mass um, where there was significant capital formation um, and a significant VC ecosystem around startups in New York. I made some angel investments. Um, I did some advisory stuff. And my partner finally was like, look, you know, this is really great that you're kind of not sitting on the sofa and like having a crisis-itis, uh, but you got to go get a job and like go figure out what, you, what you're going to do. Um, and so long story short, I met my um, business partner, John Frankel, and spent like six months as an EIR at FFBC and I've been a partner now for almost seven years. That's amazing. Yeah, John's a fantastic guy. He spoke at one of our events last year and I'm glad to see we got Tim in here now. So welcome, Tim. Thanks for joining us. Hey, how are you doing? I think I need, I'm having trouble with the uh, mic. So I'm going to just throw this in. You sound, you sound really good, actually. But um, this is like not the best, not the very best. It kind of crashes your browser every time you try to shoot. <laughs> but um, yeah, Tim, um, I think it's situated here. Um, you know, I, I'd love for you to share uh, your backstory as well, and how how you kind of got into VC and everything, and a little bit of background too on your firm. 
if you can. Sure. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So, um... Oh, now you cut out. Yeah. No, nah, I can't hear. It. We can't hear you. Can Can anyone else hear? I'm not sure if I'm the only one. No, still can't. I, we were. I was actually able to hear you pretty good with the uh, the AirPods. <laughs> I don't know if they're still going in there. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't look like Ashley's able to either. Um. Okay. Is there a way to call in? Um, no, it's strange because it was working originally. Hmm. Tim, like I quit my browser and like started again. Yeah, maybe but try refreshing it. It really worked. I'm not sure. But uh, we'll just uh, we'll move on real quick. As Tim comes in, we'll have him give his background. Um, I know, uh, AJ, you went into – kind of your your investing thesis a little bit on, on what you guys invest in and your, your specialty and whatnot. Um, if, if you want to uh, quickly kind of touching on what, what Josh was going through, have any of your firms or sorry, not firms, have any of the companies in your portfolio gotten any of these grants or have, have they applied for any of these alternative funding solutions and i don't know if you have experience with that or if you want to speak on that real quickly yeah a, a couple of our companies actually have gotten funding sources um, from various government and also just research grants um, of various types and obviously we're big advocates of this um, because alongside founders we also like non-dilutive capital because um, it sort of matches our investment dollars and provides leverage on what we're trying to do um, the biggest example I can think of is a company that we're invested in called Site that um, looks at the relationship between academic papers to establish the veracity of those academic papers. The traditional model is to um, count like citations as to figure out whether an academic paper is important or not important. And this company uses an AI um, that reviews the connections in between papers and in particular pays attention to subsequent papers refute or confirm the findings of the original paper. Um, mm -hmm. And that company has gotten um, several significant government grants, um, which have been um, really instrumental in, in building it out. Um, I will say that while it's exciting and in some sense, you know, who doesn't like free money? Um, there are burdens that are associated with uh, with these uh, with these grants. I learned that there are like specialty accounting firms that actually help you fill out like the usually the money ends up being tranched in some way. And they're like specialty accounting firms that help you fill out the right forms in the right way to spend the money in the right buckets in order to um, keep the grant money going. And it, it it is a sort of it's something that I hadn't thought of before that came up. Um, that if you should be so fortunate as to receive um, some of these outside funding sources, you should be mindful of making sure to kind of comply with all the regulations correctly. We're doing a little bit of that, by the way, with PPP um, as well. Yeah. Uh, that you know, those of us um, in the in the um, VC and the entrepreneurial community that have made applications for PPP have found that like the the rules and regulations are not necessarily clear, and you definitely need help to navigate it. Yeah, it's so new that I think even government officials aren't even sure the actual like guidelines and things. And it's just like so it's changing so rapidly. Um, it looks like Tim's back in. Tim, are you? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Oh, my God. You can't, you can't hear me. Oh, you can. Yeah. Okay. Great. 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 Yes. Fantastic. All right. This is this is amazing. I don't know if it's yeah, sorry for all of this. I know bad. You can hear me. But we're trying can. out. So we, we've been trying out some different platforms uh, for these events to give people a little bit of a better experience other than just like zoom. So thank you for bearing with us for all sure. the, uh, zoom the works really well, but, uh, but I guess. Yeah. I but I'd love to. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tim. I'm um, having trouble here. Can anybody hear me? Uh, yeah, can hear you, yeah. yeah. I can hear anything. Michael says, AJ, I hear you fine. And Timothy, I can't hear anything you're saying. Right now. Interesting. <laughs> I can hear, I, I can hear, I hear everyone in the it's corner. Loud and clear. Okay. Like, take away the mute bar next to him in the corner. He might be muted for you. Maybe. No, um, he was. He, no, I unmuted him and muted him again. 
It's all good. All right, let's see what if, if Michael and Timothy aren't. Let's see in the me. chat, AJ, guys. you just tell me when they want to ask me something because I hear you okay. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, maybe Josh, try refreshing your page then too. I'm not sure, but I can hear Tim fine. So if everyone can hear Tim, uh, drop a quick note. Okay, everyone can hear Tim. Great. Tim, if you don't mind, I'd love to hear your backstory. Tell us a little bit more about yourself, how you got into VC, and tell us more about your firm and, and the types of uh, companies you look for in your investing thesis. Sure. Yeah, and I'll try to be brief. Um, I've done a, a bunch of things since uh, um, late 1900s. Um, uh, I was an engineer for a bit. I was a chemical engineer. Um, and coded at a bunch of petroleum energy companies for a while um, as a PM um, in the, I worked for BA Systems for a bit as a project manager. So did some kind of, you know, public sector, private sector stuff as well. Um, and uh, was a patent attorney for a little bit, um, which was uh, kind of a, a odd detour, but we all make mistakes. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> Three-time founder, um, started a company in China um, along the way, um, a long time ago in 2001. So it was an interesting time. And then two in the U.S., sold all three of them. And, uh, and then in about 10 years ago, um, started angel investing a bit. And then 10 years ago, um, grouped up with uh, three of my friends, three of my engineering friends from, from Penn undergrad. And uh, we launched a venture fund in 2009. Um, and now are, uh, now we're five funds later. Um, and it's been great. It's been really fun and inspiring. Um, and so, yeah, so I got an adventure through just starting, uh, being an entrepreneur, like looping up, like my partners and I have started about 12 companies and sold eight of them. So we were kind of like, you know, operator turn to the dark yeah. side investor type. <laughs> um, and it's fun. You know, I mean, especially as you get a little later in life like operating being an entrepreneur is um one of the most powerful experiences you can have but it's also extremely uh is josh okay well, i'm okay yeah, um <laughs> oh you can hear me now that's, i, that's I hear work. everybody now this is great. oh great awesome um and uh yeah so we we started more focused but now we're kind of generalist i um i'm focused on enterprise i do a lot of um, healthcare, um, a lot of security, um, fintech, and uh, construction, uh, a lot of construction stuff. So that's kind of what I focus on. But we do everything. Like I have a partner that does a lot of um, enterprise, um, has some Air Force <laughs> contracts. Yeah, the Air Force has been really great, I'd say, Amazing. with Amazing. Uh, like this, and, and really like DOD across the board um, has just been phenomenal with just getting young smart people involved and um and just getting that relationship resetting that relationship because for a while it was impossible for a startup yeah. the sales yeah. cycles for to sell to the government were longer than your fundraising cycles so there's just no way that you could really show any milestones you, you know what happened through. timothy you know right. what happened? You can call me Tim. Only my mom calls me yeah, Tim. But, I, but well, if you I want saw, to, it's fine. Yeah. I, I almost did, and I want to respect the title. Okay. No, it's fine. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> so, Tim, what changed was um, it, it's just it's natural progression, and it had to happen, but it was hard to happen because this is years and years of doing business. They had to change the mold. What happened was the federal government was experienced and still is experiencing a compounding amount of threats, challenges to Challenge. the way they do everything they do and then their adoption of technology was so slow so they had to bridge the gap so what we're seeing coming out of the air force and it started to be a dod wide initiative and i and i would see some copycats uh, copycats popping up in whether it's you know silicon valley innovation program or even the department of transportation trying to pitch it's it's it's, it's having a mass spread effect they, they need to bridge the gap between the threats and the adoption of new technologies. And if they don't do so by making it friendly for the private sector to be engaged, um, then they're, gonna, they're going to have serious issues on their hands. And so they're doing that. And it's, it's been great. After so the Air Force programs that you were you mentioning, we, we have had a, a lot of um, good experiences with them so far. Um, and we are encouraging a lot of companies to, to approach them. Yeah, yeah, I think it's great. Um, and I think it's also just as a taxpayer, 
just a way more effective way to de deploy capital as opposed to like defense contractors. Like I worked as a defense contractor and like managed a few contracts and it's just like the inefficiency and the lack of efficacy is insane. I mean, like they get the job done, but they'll do it for like, you know, just billions of dollars more than are necessary on an, on, and in a, at a, a pace that is like abysmally slow. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think it's a really great, I, I think there's more to be more to figure out, but I think it's great. And yeah, I've worked right. with a bunch of companies that are getting the majority of the revenue from, from the Navy and the air force and um, the IC. And it's uh, yeah, I think it's going to help. It's going to help across the board. I think we got to do more and more of that. I'd yeah. like to do more deals that sell to the government. I'm always looking for good deals along those lines. So Josh, let me know if you see any companies you like. I'd love to, Love to chat with them. Okay. The closest one re recently is um, Raven. It was a former, uh, really interesting guy. He's a former SEAL, um, was active duty. Um, I think he was in dev group. And then he went to um, Columbia after with his GI Bill and studied computer science. Yeah. And then he is building this like heads up display for, for, um, for operators to you know just coordinate on the battlefield it's pretty it's pretty baller so there's a lot um, of really that, cool that's what there. we call mdo multi-domain operations that's a must-have the air force has just launched a bunch of challenges around it and it's starting to become dod wide it's just like it's the whole idea a seal i get they'll understand it because they're at the very front and that it, it relates back to it but this is something that's relevant whether it's enterprise or whether it's defense and this is what we're really seeing here is that the same challenges like an MDO, which is not something extremely military. You have a lot of information being shared with a lot of different end users. And then there's a mother that needs to get all that information and be um, seamless. Um, and, and, you know, and also make sure that no information gets lost. And then you, you when you think about it, that's, that's an enterprise. Um, and so who can, who better can provide it than private sector, you know, a potential yeah. provider. And so what we're seeing, and that, that's really opens up the channel of this whole concept of dual use, right? Something which is having um, uh, success in the private sector, on an enterprise level or medium businesses, whatever it is, can also potentially solve a challenge which the Department of Defense or the Department of Energy is facing. And so, yeah, Raven sounds super relevant. Um, I mean, in, yeah, sure. in some sense, like what's old is new here, right? You know all of the basic science and basic innovations that make everything that form the bedrock of our industry came out of DOD in the fifties. Right. right. So, right. right. None of, with, you know, without like all the transistor research and all the communications research and all of the, you know, um, microprocessor research and, you know, and Ram and all those other things like that, we, we wouldn't have an industry. We wouldn't have, have a supercomputer that can go in the pocket without the radio technology and so on and so on. Right. Do you guys remember when Al Gore made, the, when he was running for president, it was a mistake on his point because he didn't qualify his statement, but he said that he created the internet. You guys remember that? Okay. So when he was, I think what he was insinuating because the, the internet came out of, was this thing called the, the DARPA net and it came from DARPA, which is a, uh, Supposed to be advanced research for um, for like future technology. It'd be like Tony Stark probably runs it if this was you know run by Marvel. But it, it, this is uh, they created the foundation for the internet, and he maybe signed a check uh, you know in a previous position he held that led to the funding of this program. I think that's what he was was trying to say was he he recognized the potential for it. Um, but yeah, a lot of these really foundational technologies like Siri or GPS came out of the government. But then, you know, also today we see if it was only, if it was only, only deep tech once upon a time, then today it's deep tech plus um, useful tech as well. Maybe tech that isn't as deep as, as, as up, but it gets the job done efficiently um, and, and does, a, does a good job of making sure whatever the challenge is, is faced. Yeah. Yeah. I think these, it's, it's super fascinating what's happening. I, I think I, I wish honestly the government could help more out with other industries too, um, with, with some of this funding and, and have some of these uh, startups move a lot faster and solve problems quicker than, than they can. Uh, but I want to, I want to jump ahead to, to uh, a couple other topics here that we have. Um, I'd like to start maybe uh, with, with AJ and Tim and then Josh, you can share your thoughts on this too. 
Um, what are you guys looking for in founders? I know, Tim, you know, you, you were multi-founder. Uh, what are you guys looking for in these founders that you invest in? And then also the early stage companies that you invest in, like what separates your invest, the yeses from the noes when you guys are making your decisions uh, in, you know, if you could gear it maybe to the deep tech space in, a little bit in general. Um, and then Josh, for you, it's more or less what companies have you seen um, that have that founders or early stage companies that you've seen, you know, get these grants and what you've seen work really well. And we can start with AJ if you want, and then we can kind of uh, move on down to jo finish with Josh. Yeah, I mean, the, the sort of the second question is easier than the first question, which is what are you looking at, you know, in terms of the types of companies? Um, mm -hmm. when we, we have like very few like outright limitations on what it is that we'll look at, even though we have focus areas. Um, one of the things that you get to do as a seed investor is consider things that like didn't exist before. And so you can't really narrow the aperture to um, small or you would miss things that we invested in like Indiegogo before crowdfunding was a thing um, or plated before meal kits were a thing and, and sort of stuff like that. Um, but our kind of guidepost is that the business or the market or the problem that the founder is trying to address should have um, at least a hundred million dollar revenue possibility attached to it. Doesn't mean tomorrow, doesn't mean next week, it doesn't mean next year. It means that realistically the market or the problem that that the company is trying to tackle is big enough for it to be appropriate to accept venture capital which is um dilutive and complicated and burdensome and a huge investment in time um in addition of course to money um that's required to sort of make that all work and the second thing is that the founder have to have the kind of experience and connective tissue or um, or at least um, you know some work experience or advisory experience with the industry in which they're trying to tackle. Um, in some industries, this is way more important than others, um, but it's always important to, to some extent that there be um, a sort of an understanding of the rules and regulations and the way that an industry works. This we kind of find to be a problem from time to time in FinTech and InsureTech, um, where people come in with sort of ideas that they're going to like break everything uh, or move fast and, you know, break stuff or whatever in highly regulated industries where if you're just not familiar with it, you, you know, you're, you're never going to get, you're never going to get anywhere. Um, but really, um, and this is the hardest thing to articulate. And it's the hardest thing to put into words and it's really cliche and kind of every VC says the same thing or feels the same way. Um, when you meet like 20, 30 founders a week, um, there's just a certain energy and a certain force and like a certain, um, you know, almost like um, delusional belief that they're going to will something into existence that's palpable on the other side of the table. And when you get somebody in your office for these days on Zoom who has that, um, it just sort of jumps off the page. You just know that this is a person who's going to like run into walls and like move those walls to make what they're trying to happen happen. And unfortunately, you know, I, I don't know how to create a recipe for that or how to sort of say what it is other than to say, like, I walked out of that meeting with a wow sensation and sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Yeah. Tim, what are your thoughts on what, what you're looking for? I put a lot of thoughts. I dropped my, I, I wrote a Forbes article on this exact okay. topic, Great. answering the question. I dropped the link into the chat. Um, Fantastic. So people can like uh, check that out. Um, and it, it's it's very similar to what AJ said, you know, effectively. And I don't know how much time you only so I could like talk about this for hours. But so I'll just briefly hit like the high points. I think something like dovetailing on AJ said about like, you know, work relevant experience. Like it take it a little bit to the next level. And that I think that like I really like to find a founder who is building something that I think will be his or her life's work. Like something that like they were literally like put on this planet to start this company or solve this problem um, that I find to be not necessary, but like the best companies that I've backed have always been that um, where just like, it's beyond, it's not a business. It's not someone that, you know, HBS who like is searching for a problem and find something with a big market and says like, Oh, I'll try this for a few years. It's someone who's like mother died from a disease they want to cure or someone that was in like an industry for five years 
banging their head against the wall because of some problem that now they're going to solve and sell back to their entire network that dealt with the same similar problem, you know, for 10 years. So things like that, um, I, you know, I think is, is very inspiring and, it, and it's inspiring for investors, inspiring for pen, potential hires, it's inspiring for customers. So I think that, you know, is a kind of lifts, uh, it really increases the odds of success in building a large company. Another one is, which is a little more nuanced and interesting is what I, there's a concept I call wealth effect, which is basically like, you know, there's, you know, I love repeat founders, but if you've like sold a company for a billion dollars and you have, you know, $250 million in the bank, you know, generally speaking, unless you're Jack Dorsey, like you're not as hungry as, you know, someone Mm -hmm. sitting on a futon eating ramen saying like, this has to happen for me and my family and my community and my parents and all that sort of stuff. And hunger is a really important part to the journey I find because like building a company is one of the hardest things you can do. And like, there are times where just like you want to give up and it's dark and it sucks and it's four in the morning and the servers are down and you're crying and you're like, I can't do this anymore. And every founder experiences that. And if you have, you know, 50 to $250 million in the bank, you're going to be like, fuck this. And you're going to get on a sailboat and you're going to sail away. And if you can't do that, you'll keep fighting. And I'm not trying to, you know, like there are founders and people and have work ethics and it's not a moral compass or anything. It's just like, what I'm trying to do is just find the highest probability of success. And there's exceptions to every role, but generally speaking, what I like is a founder that's had a, like an eight figure exit. So sold a company from like 10 to like $80 million. So they've made a little bit of money because on the flip side, you know, if you're literally, if you're literally sitting on a futon eating ramen, you know, in like the dangerous part of town and you're building something and it could be a unicorn, you have maybe a 10% chance of like building a multi-billion dollar company, but someone comes along and says, Hey, can I take this off your hands for $50 million? And you're literally like, you know, weren't worrying about paying rent next month. You're going to take that. You're going to take that deal. You're going to take $10 million, put it in your bank account, you know, buy your parents a house, you know, buy, take a trip around the world and like live happily ever after. And that doesn't work for me. Like I, I can't have someone that's going to take an off ramp for $50 million when I need them to, when they're on a multi-billion dollar opportunity. So I like people that have, have a little bit of money in the bank um, enough that they're like slightly illogical and saying like, I'm going for it, you know? Um, and that can also be replaced with this whole, um, you know, if you're so passionate about the problem, you're just like, I don't, money is not relevant to me and I'm going to build a massive company. Um, I think that that can kind of solve for that. I'm not saying like I only back people that, you know, have like a million dollars in the bank, but like you basically have to have something that motivates you more deeply than economics. Um, I'll probably pause there cause I, I could keep going, but you can read the article. There's a lot of cool stuff on there. Like the struggle, like people have been through struggles, you know, like if you've, you know, I, I just think if you've been through hard times together, especially as a team, the odds of, of, of getting through the gauntlet is huge. Integrity is massive for me. Self-awareness is fundamentally important for everyone, but particularly for a CEO who like every three to six months, your job description is entirely different. You know, when you have, you know, three people in a garage and then you have like 25 people in a small office and you have a hundred and then you have like a thousand, like your job's changing constantly. If you're not self-aware and constantly developing, you can't, you can't really make it. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. I can talk too much and I apologize. Yeah, that was awesome. Those are fantastic points. And I think uh, like Damon John even has a book, The Power of Broke, right? It's like there, there is power in, in struggling and, and, you know, in grinding and hustling and like, seen that uh because it makes you focus on it makes you want to not like continue to live that and power through it and whatnot so i think that that's huge um and i think entrepreneurship fundamentally too from what i've seen you know having successful founders and investors speak at our events as well it's like there there's so much to be said for being absolutely obsessed with something and a lot of people say when we ask like a similar question they say something along the lines of it has to like to start a company it has to be something you can't not do like you have to do this or it's going to drive you crazy knowing that you didn't do it right and it's something that is big enough to keep you focused through the ups and downs of of entrepreneurship but I thought those points were fantastic. 
yeah, your Forbes article is is great too. I was just checking that out. So definitely look at that guys. And then um, Josh, if you want to uh, add to that, as far as what are the companies that you've seen successful getting these grants and, and some, some of the funding through, through these government programs. Sure. Um, so I guess it's a little different here because in, in the world of federal funding, it's it, there. It splits up into two. It's what what are you looking for in the founders themselves? Like who, who should what's the, what's the deal with the founders? And then there's the tech itself because you're not just investing in a tech that's you know, you know going to build the future of industry, and make an exit, and then you know hopefully you know the investors see back on their investment. Um, but they're also looking to potentially become buyers. So they're that they're two the coin, I suppose. And if I look at the, what do they look for in an investor? Uh, is a, in, in the team itself and the founders, they're looking for um, either you know having a history of getting it done in the past, um, because they want to make sure that their federal dollars are going to go to um, people who are capable of it performing on a complex research and development plan. Um, they want to make sure that um, if if it's not a history of getting it done, then they have the right you know t- letters at the end of their name to pick up the the belief that they could get it done. Um, and also be you know patents under their, their names or the company itself having filed patents for the given technology. Now those aren't mutually exclusive. Um, you could just have a great getting it done or um, have the you know the quote unquote skill set that your title um, uh, indicates. Um, but it's usually one of those two because when <clears throat> the you know the Department of Defense is splitting between um, investing in a company with. Uh, the founders that have gone, done in the past or they have a PhD on, on the board or on, is one of their you know, CTOs or you know, main engineers um, and uh, you know, a bunch of guys that graduated high school and are working in a garage right now, um, they're probably going to invest in the former. Um, the other part, which, is, which can make the initial part totally obsolete, is um, the tech itself. Um, especially with the emergence of the interest in dual use technology, which we were talking about a little bit before, um, some federal government programs are prioritizing market traction. Others couldn't care less about it. It really depends on the program itself, but it, on, this, on the human side, they're looking to see what the, what the done in the past and, and who they are. Um, and then on the tech side, they're looking to say, always, oh, how is this relevant for us? And has this been tested? Um, and at least for the faster funding mechanisms. For the slower funding mechanisms, it's a good idea. It's great technology. It's a great team. Let's make the investment, even though there's no market traction. That's amazing. Yeah, that's that's really insightful stuff, uh, Josh. Thank you for that. Uh, real quick, before we uh, jump into some Q and A here, I want to respect uh, the speakers' times and everything. Um, Let's jump into the current situation. There's obviously a lot going on right now. Um, So I'd love to hear from from all of you guys, and we can kind of do the same rotation to our, and specifically this question for AJ and and, and Tim, are you guys currently investing with COVID going on, right? And then what have you seen as far as the industry in general, um, as far as VC funding, angel funding, some of your portfolio companies, are they struggling to raise right now? Or, you know, where should people be looking? If they're trying to raise money right now, what are the different strategies people should be doing? How should they be reaching out to investors? So one being, are you guys actively investing? And what are you kind of doing as like your individual firms? And then two, maybe an overall picture as to what you've seen in the investing industry itself and then josh i'd love for you to talk about i know you spoke of this at the beginning but maybe you can go into it a little bit too as to what you're seeing from you know the grant and and government side too for people who came in a little bit late start with aj so we we are actively investing um that's kind of the headline um i uh we're participating um, in a deal that we gave the green light to like a week and a half ago, and I'm about to put out a term sheet um, in the next day or two um, on a different deal. So we're definitely actively investing. Um, but I will say that the shift of our focus for the moment in terms of looking at new deals or looking at the existing portfolio has definitely shifted a bit to existing portfolio because our existing portfolio has just needed our help a lot. Um, Past, right. uh, over the past couple of weeks. 
Um, if you had asked me this question a month and a half ago, I would have said, you know, stuff is really tough out there. We are actually investing. We wouldn't have yet done a new term sheet or put out another check um, at that point. Yeah. Um, but that for the most part, um, people were kind of hunkering into their own portfolios and reserving capital um, to assist their companies that didn't have access to capital outside of the existing insiders. And I would say like at least 70% of what we've done um, over the past two months or so has been focused on um, investments into companies that are already in our portfolio. Gotcha. Okay. Tim, well, how about you? Um, I think that, uh, I mean, it, uh, uh, you mean, obviously AJ is, is, is doing this. I think that every venture capitalist is saying like, we're open for business and we're doing new deals. But I think the reality is, is that like everyone is definitely like the pace of investing is definitely slowed down um, for, for several reasons. One, the one is mainly what AJ said that like, you know, we're in a whole new world. Like basically every company, every founder globally right now needs to reevaluate the product market fit. Right, like we're in a new world temporarily, and probably in a different world forever. And um, some business models and some products are just going to be way more relevant, way less relevant. So, like, there's been a lot of work. I think a good seed investors are basically experts in achieving, helping people achieve product market fit. So, like, we're doing a ton of work around that. Some companies were just like, we're going to like a lot of. I mean, I've had more board meetings in the last month than i probably had in the year prior honestly and like you know, um yeah and you know around you know everything from pvp to like just like you know we're fucked what are we going to do um you know layoffs it's just it, it's an endless amount of portfolio work you know the average venture capitalist is on like five to ten boards i'm on seven boards seven eight boards right now so it's a lot of work um doing that stuff but yeah, you I mean I'm doing? It, I, I'm still like I'm not sure. I'd love to hear. I'd love to do a. Can we do poll? Does, does this poll thing work? Um, yeah, yeah, we can do can a you poll right now. Set it up, or do I do it? But like, so I'm today can doing my up? first post-COVID in-person entrepreneur meeting. Like I'm. A, I want to. Yeah, I want to get a term. I know that's. I, I mean, if people hate me for this, I, I just want to get a sense because I'm thinking of deciding whether or not I should tweet about this. <laughs> We're going to meet in a park. Good. We're going to both wear a mask and, and we're going to stay six good. feet apart from each other. You know, so it's yeah, socially good. distant. We both live What's five the... minute walk from this park, yeah. and so we're going to meet Great. there, wear masks, and stay six feet apart. But like, we generally don't like to invest without meeting the founder. And so I'm going to do it. Yeah. And um, what's the what's the question that like what's and, like that you like what are your views on that? Like, if I tweet about that, or am I going to get hated on, or are people going to be like, "That's cool," or like, I think most people are going to be like, "This is irresponsible," and you're like killing babies and like stay home. Um, I'm just not sure. Or people will be like, "Wow, okay, like that makes sense. It's, this is the new world." Um, to I don't me, know. I don't know how how I would overcome like my personal anxiety of like leaving these four walls, except directly <laughs> in the parking garage in my apartment. Building. I'll be honest with you. I'm so excited to like leave my house and meet a human being and talk about you know business yeah. in person instead of these Zoom things. Um, I like can't wait. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, yeah, yeah, I'm just, yeah so I, don't I, I agree with you, but it's like, like I, I just put up the poll okay. real quick. I just threw up, if you guys go to the polls tab, what I put was, are you okay with people meeting in person if they wear masks and say six feet apart? Yeah. So let's see, we'll see what people say. Everybody I mean, yes, so far of the one. I mean, right now it's 50 50. So we'll, we'll see. Uh, please go over to the polls tab and vote on that so we can. Uh, really see, I just don't want to get I mean, like I've gotten I, I, like I, I, viscerated on yeah. Twitter from like Bill Gurley and stuff for like various topics, and I just I don't like getting like pummeled on Twitter, and I'm afraid if I like post a picture of a socially distant entrepreneur meeting, I'm gonna just people are just gonna like destroy me. So, um, so I'm just trying to. This is like a a, a large enough audience that I'm open about it, but and I can get some data, but small enough that you know there's not too much repercussions. So we have a couple people asking, where do you live? What state are you in? In what I city? I live in San Francisco, and um, okay. San Francisco has actually been the best city for they. Honestly, they've done the best job out of anyone, uh, in my opinion, at least. So we have twenty-one. Yes, it's okay. Eight. 
knows so yeah, far. We'll keep, we'll keep Thanks, going. guys. I really appreciate this. This is a great, like, real time uh, <laughs> kind of uh, reality check to, like, how people are feeling about this sort of thing. And this is the community I care about, right? Like, sure, I'm going to get a lot of random people mad, but, like, entrepreneurs that were looking for funding, those are the people I care about most in the world, um, other than my, my LPs. Um, so yeah, well, that's actually that, the LPs are a whole different, you know, issue. Like we, 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 you know, we're in the middle of, um, you know, of a fund, right. And, um, we're in the middle of all these discussions with large institutions. And so, you know, we can sort of sympathize and empathize with what's going on in the founder community, um, suffering in the same way that a lot of our investors want to meet with us, um, uh, but can't, and we're sort of trying to figure out how to do that in a way that's you know consistent with the reality that we're in now yeah another quick thing too right before josh we, we hear your thoughts on this are you guys seeing maybe an influx of also font or companies startups and are you guys interested in investing in companies that maybe are related to covid right so i've seen a lot of companies come out they've pivoted maybe or i've seen a lot of you know even I think Oracle just acquired a video sharing company. There, there's a lot of companies and things going on for COVID specific things. Are you guys maybe looking into comp like to invest in companies that might be thriving during these times as well? Um, for more, maybe you know going toward more towards this digital mindset. Have you guys looked into like COVID specific or maybe virtual or you know companies that are going to be able to thrive during these times? Have you looked into those at all? Have those come up a lot over the last few I mean, months? Of course. I mean, like, I think that's what everyone is doing right now is like I, my one partner came with this term. I, I don't know if I necessarily sits well with me because like, pr like pro cyclical with COVID, but like, you know, like there's, yeah, I mean, there's a, a shift in everything. Communication, distributed work um, are kind of indirect things, but then, or, or I guess direct, but then there's also like, you know, I've been pitched literally a dozen times now on, you know, the attempt to be like the, the red, green, you know, the red, green, um, yellow kind of tracking contact, you know, app. So I think there's a ton of people working on that. They kind of want to become the de facto, you know, the kind of, you know, in China, what they're doing around, you know, contact, um, you know, monitoring and all that sort of stuff. So there's a ton of that. There's a ton, a lot of healthcare stuff. I've been really, I do a lot of healthcare. I'm really leaning into security and healthcare because I think that um, with the, the amount of, distribute like distributed work on cloud services and everything is going to create a lot more endpoints and a lot more um, opportunities for compromises on the security front. So I think there's some new security paradigms that are going to need to be figured out. It's also just been like an, an enormous amount of cyber attacks during this time because everyone's vulnerable, everyone like, you know, like phishing and everything else has been like really intense. Um, so I think that's going to be big. And then just healthcare in general. Like, I just think there's a, t and FinTech, right? It, like, no, like, there's not been a time when, like, doctors and, like, you know, you know, uh, infectious disease experts are kind of, like, the the heroes and, like, the sexiest people on the planet yes. right now. And, like, that's such a new era. And everyone's so lightning, yeah. like, focused on their health and healthcare and learning and doing all this stuff. So I think it's going to be a huge opportunity on healthcare, yeah. um, on the consumer front and enterprise front, and then FinTech too. I think like everyone, like we're gonna hit, in my opinion, the biggest recession that we've seen in our lifetime. And that we're in, a, I call a bull trap right now. Just like, I think we're in a little bit of a run up where people are just delusionally thinking that this is gonna yeah. be a V shape. Um, uh, and we could fight about this for days and we don't need to, but like, you know, there's gonna definitely be some sort of correction, recession. And a lot of people live hand to mouth and, you know, I think everyone's going to be way more focused on their financial health in the next, you know, years and decades. So I think that there's a lot of FinTech opportunities as well. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Just uh, first of all, I want to say I said no on the poll. I'm just going to say it right out there. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. And anyone that's no, if you want to express your views and tell me that I should, and I'm open to not doing it, if you think that I should be jailed for it or something like that. <laughs> I don't well, think anybody should um, be jailed. I, AJ was a no too, I'm sure. So I'd love to hear your guys' opinion on like that. Not even close. Like, no. Like, I know you wouldn't do it, but do you think it's immoral or wrong for me to do it? And so why? 
Well, I think everybody needs to evaluate, you know, his or her own risk based on their own sort of set of facts and circumstances, right? The, the only thing that matters is that, um, you know, in this sort of personal decision-making, personal responsibility framework, where I think we're generally heading in this whole sort of economy as we try and figure out how to reopen, is um, do you increase the probability of asymptomatically transmitting the virus to somebody else, right? Mm-hmm. So if you can take responsibility for yourself and put yourself in a position where you're wearing a mask and six feet away and so on and so on, you may increase your own risk, but you're doing everything that you can to mitigate the people around you. Like that's, there, there's a sort of, you know, people can have their own individual sort of calibration as, as to what their risk assessment is for themselves personally. Uh, but as Governor Cuomo says all the time, like what you don't have is the right to put somebody else in harm's way. Sure. So if we can figure out a way to put to not put other people in harm's way, then it, it's fine. I'm just not sure. I, I like I feel like the research is still really weird, and we're getting all this contradictory yeah. stuff. So I don't know what that means yet. So I right. I, th- I think this is a fantastic uh, debate, and it, and amazing is suddenly prioritizing someone else's safety, well-being is finally the most talked about um, subject globally. So just if we can take a moment and appreciate what that is and the fact that, you know, Tim's even be you know, out there and, and wanting to hear it, AJ is expressing his opinion. The fact that that is the, the subject matter, what a correction for, for, for peoplehood. I mean, for society in general, I think that's amazing. Um, I, I think when, if we... When we go back to the opportunities that are out there for COVID-19, um, there's definitely – what we're seeing is if the federal government is supposed to come and supposed to supplement um, a vacuum of opportunity from the private sector, which, Tim, you're being honest here. Like that, that's a reality here. People are being very careful right now. So what we're seeing is um, basically you can put it on four different timeline-related investments, and it, foc- it, it splits up into about six different – um, focus areas. The timelines are, does if it's COVID-centric, I'm not talking about the standard investment. Those are still there. This, the same issues that the federal agencies have been dealing with until now. Of course, telecommunication became bigger. 5G became bigger. Um, data became bigger. Um, cyber became bigger, as it already was. And then the overlay of all the different um, softwares that are included in it, of course, AI and, and machine learning are uh, inseparable from all the other technologies that I mentioned. So if I go back to COVID-19 centric opportunities, we see that it can be split into four different timelines. Virus ramp up, which is, you know, if it's spreading and we're trying to understand it and how do we mitigate its impact, do you have technologies which will assist us with that? This is, by the way, this is all based on a new Department of Defense opportunity that for some time. Um, another one is social distance. Sorry, as I dropped myself. Um, another one is social distancing related technologies, which is when you have people who are working from home, how do we, how do we assist them? That could be telecommunication, that could be 5 Gs, all the other stuff we're talking about. Another is return to normal. Um, this has everything to do with ensuring um, safe payment platforms, um, way to um, serve workstations, whether it's a construction site or whether it's um, you know, making sure that in your office building you're keeping up with whatever regulations that need to be kept there. Um, this is why fintech, which has been interesting for the federal government, is probably very interesting today for the federal government. So if once upon a time there was some interest, there's a lot more interest in it today. Um, and then the new normal, which is being resilient to future outbreaks, which is um, also really important here. And I'm, I'm speaking totally on the non-medical side. Uh, and then if I, if I split it up into focus areas, it would be combating the spread, which is analytics, um, a threat to current activities, decision support, welfare of citizens, which is be transportation, movement of goods, people's logistics, um, HR related functions, um, readiness, um, which is um, continuing operations through the outbreak, um, logistics, industrial based impacts, which is anything to do with small businesses or payments, um, large system programs. Um, and then medical, which is not something we touch upon um, in Eagle Point funding. And, and then anything else, the government's being open saying, what else could you do? Where are our blind spots? Teach it to us. Um, there's a request for right now being put out there, which is going to be followed up with um, a commercial solutions opportunity um, from the Department of Defense, which is a way to engage in, in um, uh, a seamless contract with the federal government. 
Um, so there's a lot out there. Um, and that's not even touching upon the standard technologies, which are, are just as relevant as ever. Um, so it, it's kind of the bizarre world of what's going on in, I suppose, in, in the private sector is the federal government has to step up because if they don't, then the, Tim, the, the you know, doomsday um, a, you know, financial situation that God forbid should happen, um, the government is there to hopefully to soften the blows and I hope that they're successful at it. And I hope that, you know, you know, please God, we, we get back on our feet much, much faster than the predictions are. Yeah. So thank you for that, Josh. Um, so right now it looks like we're 75, 25, Tim, uh, three to one. Yes. So, um, and we had 36 people vote. So, um, you know, it seems like the majority of people are okay with the fact uh, of you going and doing the meeting as long as you wear a mask and, and everything. Um, and, and before we wrap up here, I want to make sure that you guys are okay on time because I know we, we went a little over three o'clock here. Um, and, and just so we can ask a, a few questions from the audience here real quick before, uh, before we let you guys go. Um, there's a, a couple people here, Amy and... Uh, and B Pasco that are asking about the supply chain and logistics um, effects with this. Um, if you guys are are interested in that space at all and how that's you know pertaining to this, um, you know, and you know, Josh, maybe even too, if the, if you want to touch on if the government's even interested in this stuff as well, because uh, I think right now I saw a report a couple of days ago about Tyson, you know, and there's a lot of you know things in the media right now about, oh, the meat supply chain's broken and all this other, all these other concerns with supply chain and logistics, um, especially since this is a global phenomenon, you know, shipping, tracking, all this sort of thing um, and the transportation could be an issue. So um, if you guys want to, and I, and I know I don't want to keep you guys longer than, uh, than you have time for, if you have to move on to other things, then we can wrap up. But if you have time, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that before we wrap up here. AJ and Tim, you got any thoughts on supply chain logistics? Go ahead, AJ. I was going to let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> not, obviously not. I don't know. No, uh, yeah. um, supply chain logistics. I mean, I also love, I, I am looking at a couple, I, I mean, I have this, this thesis that like, that I'm almost giving up on, but like that, that someone's going to get their hands on enough data to just optimize and fix like the massive um, like fragmentation and inefficiency problem in domestic trucking in North America. And- um, you, you couldn't team me up better. This is like amazing, keep going. Yeah, and so like I, like I almost did Transfix and I passed, I love Drew and like, you know, I know the founder of Convoy and like I've seen these, I think these are like glorified brokers. And I don't know, AJ, if, you've, if I mention any company you invest in, I apologize, but like, I still think there's, I still think someone's going to build like a, you know, like a, a massive comp, like, you know, like a 12 figure company um, in this space. And so I'm always looking for that, but it's, you're not going to just like build a marketplace scrape from the list boards and call shippers and get off the ground and make that happen. Like there's, you got to find a more elegant kind of wedge. And I don't know if that's like a virtual carrier or um i've seen like with lds like some people doing really interesting things with lds um to get a lot of data and get in front of drivers but you know i, I definitely have that that's my kind of leading thesis in space and then i, I mean my my partner in terms of deep tech i have a partner that's just deeply passionate about synthesized protein you know synthesized meats and it's environment like it's definitely the future for sure, you know, I mean, like the the amount of environment, environmental damage that cattle um, produces is, if you really look at it, um, it's and you're intellectually honest, it's unbelievable and completely. I wouldn't say immoral, but like, you know, I love beef. We all love beef, right? Like, if you can synthesize that and make some tasty beef in the lab, then that's you know healthy and environmentally you know sound. Um, it, that I think there's a huge future there, like, you know, um, as well. And so we're looking at that. It's just tough. Like, how is that going to not be a commodity? Like, like meat is a commodity. When you go to the grocery store, you don't go and buy, like, you don't buy, you know, your steaks from a certain company. It's just a commodity. So 
how does someone, you know, have any defensibility or brand equity around something like that? I don't know. But th those are my two kind of thoughts on the touch upon that. And then I teed up AJ for something. Like yeah, I mean, you know, I agree with you, by the way, on both. Like, we, we have a we have a, an investment in a company called New Age Meats um, yeah, yeah. That, that is doing exactly what you're talking about. And I, there's no way um, that it's that it's not the future for an assortment of reasons, just the way that we're doing um, beef production in this country and elsewhere around the world is just not sustainable. Um, and if you're not concerned about um, the ethics, you should be concerned about the environmental stuff. And if you're not concerned about the environmental stuff, you should be concerned about just like land use and resource utilization and water. And um, just at some point, it's not, it just doesn't work the way that we're doing it. Um, but on the transportation um, front, I, I also, I, I agree with you um, strongly that, um, you know, there, there just doesn't exist yet a, a proper solution to the problem of independent trucking or sort of on-demand load sharing or whatever. And there was a lot of enthusiasm. We've been studying this problem for like years. Um, There's a lot of enthusiasm around um, like Uberization, um, not that I like that term, but actually exactly relevant here um, of truckload um, shipping um, in various ways and in various forms some as virtual shippers some as load board management things and so on and like that none of that stuff works that stuff because works. it's all too patented and it's just it's kind of like a mess um, one of the investments though that I one of the two investments that I just mentioned that we're kind of getting close to um, and I hope to close uh, in the next month or so is actually into uh, a software company that deals with uh, projections in the medium term, like over a week, over 10 days of what, um, of how an independent um, single owner or fleet owner of trucks should accept or not accept loads on various load vault boards based on projections of what's likely to happen in the destination city over the next couple of days. So like this is a huge, oh, that's really interesting. it's a huge problem. Is right there now. room for like 10% in that one or is it? Kind of towards the end of the process. Well, it's to, so like send send me a note. There there may be room. This, is, this was like okay. a, a a big pre COVID term sheet term. Oh, did they did, did, they, re, did they rebalance on valuation or is it still pre COVID valuation? No, no. It's it, there's been an adjustment. This is how it happens, guys. By the way, this is this is like EC uh, like at one hundred one. It, it's smaller, but it's it's good. This is a, this is a good one, and I I've been following. This is That's like. Great. Back to the founder stuff, right? This is a founder that I've been literally talking to for three years. Like yeah. in my experience, those are the very best ones when someone is like just too early and you kind of talk, you build a relationship. And now it's like, I'm not scared of not knowing this person. Like this guy is someone who's been in my office like 10 times and we've had right. like long and very deep conversations about stuff and he just wasn't ready and it wasn't going to get through the investment committee. Um, and then it was, right? Yeah. Well, if if, it, if you guys do do a deal, make sure uh, Antra gets uh, a little like half a half a point or something in that for for putting this together. <laughs> I'm just I'm just messing around, but this is awesome. I'm 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 loving this. Um, Josh, have you seen anything um, as far as government's interest into this space at all? Yeah. Um, yeah. Logistics, trucking, any of that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, hey, actually, this will be offered. That was just reading off of a list that I have in front of me right now. It's something relevant now. Um, it's focusing on logistics as it also from a security side and protection side of logistic, logistics. This is super relevant, whether it's energy grid related or it's just, you know, the use of any sort of autonomous vehicles. That's one of the biggest um, scary uh, points. Um, supply chain protection and assessment. Um, then there's anything that touches upon the movement of people and goods, right? Because we don't know what's going to go on. Um, I, I had a great conversation um, last week with a company that basically what they, uh, they had um, basically standard usage of cameras. It's a, it's a very specific uh, use case, but what they were doing is they were just sending out photographers um, to take pictures of construction. This is also super relevant. It's a little bit less supply chain. It has everything to do with what enables for supply chain to happen. And they were going to places like factories or construction sites. Um, and th through usage of digital photos, they had um, a really complex um, AI um, and digital reproduction of these, these, this, these photo photos using computer vision um, to give you a full picture of um, production 
um, of people on site, um, et cetera. The, the, the really cool application of very simple it's a usage of hardware meets a really complex usage of software. Um, so yeah, that, that's super relevant because when we go to the back to the new normal or getting used to um, doing business with the current situation, um, you need innovative ways to allow for logistics and supply chain um, to, to exist. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, okay, I think we're going to uh, get yeah, wrapped up here. Yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate your guys' this time. Yeah, this, was, this was awesome. Um, if you want, uh, we can just end with where can people learn more about you, get in touch with you, um, if, if they're interested in, in chatting or if you're interested in hearing, you know, pitches or, or where should people follow you if you are active on Twitter. Oh, it looks like Tim's dropping his. Okay. There, there's Tim's Twitter. Fantastic. Um, AJ, if you're on there. What's crazy, too, is like I just realized how uh, popular the VC Twitter game is. And um, if you guys aren't on Twitter and you're raising money right now, you're missing out because VCs – are are on there a lot and I feel like we're like the only like it's like trump and vcs are the only people that like use twitter as much <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 yeah. I, I had absolutely no I idea don't tweet a lot but i lurk a lot <laughs> so yeah. you sort of have to watch what other people are saying it's pretty wild it gets pretty it gets pretty crazy yeah. the fights are really fun yeah <laughs> exactly all right thank you guys so much um josh are you do you want to stay on there was a question to um specifically directed to you so if you want to stay on we can go through a couple more things in specific to the like, grants and stuff like that if you want um I, I, mean, I actually think i think the best way is is to follow up uh by email okay. set up set up some time afterwards i'll go drop an email again in the chat um, okay perfect uh, just just in general i would say my my words to to anybody who's going after federal grants, whether or not um, you're interested in working um, with us, it's something you should strongly consider, especially right now. Um, there, there's just so many opportunities of it around it. And if you have to consider what dual use means um, and and how you could frame your technology in something that could be also be relevant for the federal government, you could potentially yeah. also be opening yourself up to something which is significant long term and can lead to the health. Of business, but also your business thriving in a really, really challenging time. So yeah. those are my thoughts. I'll, I'll, I'll drop my email in there. Um, guys, it was really, uh, okay. yes, I, I learned a lot. Michael, thanks for setting it up. And uh, thanks for everybody for joining in. Of course. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Michael. That was great. So, You're a great moderator. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, anytime. So right now, there's actually, if you guys look, you guys don't have to do this, obviously, but there's, there's we're going to move over to the networking section. So with this platform, we're actually going to FaceTime one-on-one -on -one with the other attendees. Um, obviously, you guys can head out. I want to be respectful of your time. But for all the people watching, there's a networking button on the left-hand side. Click that, and you'll automatically get matched with someone for five minutes. Um, and then you'll get matched with somebody else. So you actually be able to FaceTime and meet other people during this time. Uh, but thank you guys so much. This was awesome. You guys killed it. Um, you know, I really appreciate having you here and sharing your insights and everything. So thank you so much and take care, be healthy, be safe. Tim, if you do go out, <laughs> you know, make sure you wear that mask and, and everything. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I appreciate it, man. Thank you guys so much. Right. Bye guys. Thank you. Give, Thanks, everyone. give us a report um, of, of how it goes. <laughs> I'm sure he will. I'm sure he will. All right. Thanks, AJ. Thanks, Josh. Take care. All right, guys. Um, like I said, there's a networking tab right on the left side of your screen. I'm not sure if I'm opposite or not, but on the left side of your screen, you'll see a networking button. You click that, go through there. You'll be able to like match up with other attendees, FaceTime, meet some new people, have some interesting conversations. I'm gonna head over there right now. There's also going to be a free live stream that we're doing and starting in the next uh, five minutes or so on social media. I'll drop the links in there for that too if you guys wanna check that out as well. It's gonna be another interview with a founder. He's raised a bunch of money. Um, it's a fantastic uh, show that our partner Charlie's doing. I'll drop the links in the chat for that too. But thank you guys so much for tuning in. Go over to the networking section and then uh, I'll drop the links for the live stream too. Thanks so much, guys.